Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Venick. Today's show is one of two in which you'll get to hear both candidates for governor of New Hampshire in a race that will be over in just a few weeks, believe it or not. My guest today is Maggie Hassan, who is the Democratic nominee for the seat. And as you know, Maggie has a very long list of accomplishments, not the least of which is that she's had a long career as a corporate attorney, has served in the New Hampshire Senate, including in a leadership position. I don't want to use up a lot of the time today going through her extensive resume, so what I'll ask you to do is to go to the BCTV website at www.bedfordtv.com to view a previous show that we did together. And just click on the Channel 16 schedule in the search box on the upper left, type in Tell It Like It Is, and then when the new page comes up, just look for the show titled Race to the State House with guest Maggie Hassan, and it will be dated May 8th. I do, however, want to take the time to tell you the very impressive list of endorsements that Maggie has received during her campaign. Among other people, somebody nobody knows, the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton, who's actually been in town a couple of times now stumping for her, the Manchester Police Patrolmen's Association, the National Education Association, New Hampshire Chapter, the American Federation of Teachers, the United Steel Workers, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the New Hampshire Chapter of NARAL, and EMILY's List, which of course is a national group uh, of women very interested in health issues. And I'd also like to tell you that unlike the other interviews done previously with the gubernatorial candidates in which basically I asked them all kind of the same questions so you could get a sense of each of them. With this round, I'm asking questions that really are more geared to each person's campaign um, because all of them have developed very intense platforms and that's what they want to get across to you, not just a bunch of stock questions. So, with that, Maggie, it's great to have you back. Thank you for and having you me. You look terrific. I thought Thanks. you'd come in looking tired. You look like you know, you, you've been um, on a vacation in Aruba or something. Well, I've just been having a great time during this campaign talking to voters, and it's the best thing about New Hampshire is that people really do engage. We're an all-hands-on-deck kind of state, yeah. so everybody's engaged in their communities in so many different ways. And when you campaign for governor, they really have a lot to tell you, a lot that they hope you'll be able to accomplish, mm -hmm. and they really want to know what life want us to know what life mm -hmm. is like for them and what they care about and what a gift it is to be able to campaign and this is a big year too people are wound up over a number of different yeah, things I so think that's they're fair. probably more vocal than ever yeah <laughs> um, now in our earlier interview you did say and I know you've yeah. said it all along consistently throughout your campaign is that your number one job as governor will be to improve the New Hampshire economy yeah. and of course in that create new jobs so I know you have a plan, yep. so tell us about it. Sure, I have something that we call the Innovate New Hampshire Plan. And Just it's like your website title. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and it focuses on making sure that we have targeted tax credits to help our businesses, uh, technical assistance uh, to help our businesses, and uh, a strong and skilled workforce. Because when I travel around the state, what I'm hearing most from business leaders, and it doesn't matter, small business, large business, tourism industry, manufacturing, they need workers who can do 21st century jobs. And so if we focus on those things, I want to double the research and development tax credit, for instance. I want to leverage the expertise and research that we have at our universities and colleges to give technical assistance to our businesses. Mm -hmm. And then I want to focus on making sure that we have the best workforce in the nation because when I, that's, all of those things are things I'm hearing from businesses about what their needs are. When we make sure that everyone knows that if you come to New Hampshire, you're on the cusp of, a, of really starting a whole new industry or you've got mm -hmm. um, a high-tech idea you're going to need specially trained workers for, that we really have a flexible and strong education system and a responsive government so that we can help you get those workers um, right right the minute you come in. That will attract innovative businesses here and they'll come here to start and they'll stay here to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so important yeah. now especially. Right. Now I know that there's more than one school of thought as to what's the best method of establishing the state budget. You've served in the Senate yeah. so you have ideas. Do you think we're on the right track or do you think the changes are, are really needed? Well I certainly think there's some changes that are needed. I'm very proud that I served on a team with Governor Lynch that 
balanced, um, I balanced a couple of state budgets, uh, but particularly in 2009, in the worst economy since the Great Depression, we balanced a budget. We made some very tough choices. We had to close some programs, close outdated facilities. Uh, we had to make some cuts that were difficult choices for us to make, but we did it so that we could focus on the state's priorities, protecting its citizens and its economy. Because you have to have a balanced budget mm -hmm. or the rest of anything you're going to do for economic development won't work. And we did that. We left the, that budget process. Uh, at the end of the budget process, we had a $20 million dollar surplus, uh, which is really pretty astounding given how a much nice our revenues are. Yeah, well, especially in 2009, yeah. our revenues dropped by about 25 percent back to pre-2004 levels. So we had to make hard choices. And I'm the only candidate for governor who's actually balanced a budget. And uh, that being said, there are some things that we could do differently. And I've proposed uh, budget reforms, uh, really three things we should be doing. One is we need to have a consensus-based revenue panel. And that just means that instead of having Democrats and Republicans arguing in the legislature mm -hmm. about what our revenue projections are, and that's how you base the budget, mm -hmm. um, instead of having those kind of partisan battles about the facts, we should have a consensus revenue panel that includes Democrats and Republicans from the legislature, but also people from the executive branch and um, finance and uh, financial experts on the panel so that we can have a consensus going forward about what the facts are that we're starting with. So mm -hmm. that's number one. Number two is that we need to improve our audit process. We have a legislative audit, audit office, which is very good, uh, but they don't always uh, audit the largest agencies where we could find the most savings. So we need mm -hmm. to make sure that we're auditing the right places. And then we have a bad habit of getting these audit reports. Um, but not really doing much with them. them so we the need shelf. to make sure that yeah. we're actually implementing those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I think it's really important that we have performance metrics for all of state government so that we know what standards we're holding our state agencies and employees to. Uh, they know too. We have an evaluation process to see how we're doing. And then we actually post our results online because that's what you really want is you want taxpayers to understand how their money is being used and you want to hold yourself to standards and hold yourself accountable so if you need to make improvements you can. Mm. Mm. I like that panel idea. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. That's a good one. I like uh, that. I'm glad. Yeah. Now, I know you've been very strongly opposed to funding cuts to UNH. Um, do you think that the funding should be completely restored to previous levels, increased? are gradually restored with a hard look where there might be some cost savings. Well, thank you for the question. And you know, one of the things that happened in this last budget session was the university system got cut by half by this legislature led by Speaker O'Brien at the same time that they cut the cigarette tax by uh, 10 cents. So they might as well have said to our young people, smoke more, study less. And that's not what we should be communicating to our young people. Mm -hmm. We need an educated workforce. It's the core of all of our economic development going forward. And so what I've talked about is restoring at least most of that funding. I'd like to get as close to that uh, previous level as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also said to the university system, if we're going to do that, we need to freeze tuition at New Hampshire's colleges and universities and community colleges because our families and our students need to be able to afford to go to school here. If they can't, they're going to leave the state to find a less expensive college elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And once they do that, they're not likely to stay here. So it's about opportunity for all of our citizens. And it's also about keeping our young people here so that we'll have the workforce of tomorrow um, skilled, ready to go. So um, I think we can freeze tuition, uh, restore most of the cuts. Um, I'd like to get back to the total restoration level. Um, and we're going to have to look at some of the bad decisions this legislature made um, and think about reversing them like that cigarette tax cut in order to find the dollars to do what we need to do. And that was going to be my question. Yeah. So that would be one of the ways to right. upset the tuition freeze? Right. Yep. Okay. Um, now, I know another thing that, that you've been very out there on, obviously, is health care. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. mind these days. 
10 New Hampshire hospitals have sued the state, and apparently now the cases are going forward, over the loss of the federal Medicaid reimbursements to the state that were made by the feds that were used for other state obligations. Right. What are your thoughts on this? Well, we've got a, a big challenge in health care, um, yes. something I led on in the state Senate. You know, one of the very first things I did as a state senator when I was a member of the minority party in my first term was I put together a coalition of Republicans and Democrats to change an insurance law that had been passed uh, by the previous governor. Um, to, that allowed insurance companies to discriminate against sick workers. And we came together, Democrats and Republicans, and changed that law. And I also worked to make sure that young people could stay on their parents' health insurance up to age 26. We mm -hmm. did that before the federal government did it in the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act. Um, and I also worked very hard on trying to make sure that we had better transparency in what was driving up our underlying health care costs, because New Hampshire has expensive health care. We have good health care. Um, but what we want to make sure is that we have high quality health care at an affordable price for all of our citizens because mm -hmm. it's important for human health and human dignity. It's really important too though for the economy. Mm -hmm. If we don't have a healthy workforce, we can't have the best workforce in the country either. So that's an issue that I am um, well uh, experienced in. One of the major differences in this race is about the way my opponent and I would go at health care. Something your viewers should know is that my opponent has indicated that he wants to block grant, which means have the, the state opt out of the federal Medicare program. And he would allow this legislature that's made the cuts you just described mm -hmm. uh, to run health care for our seniors. I think that's a really bad idea. I think Medicare works pretty well. We have to strengthen it and we have to reform it in some ways, but we need to preserve it. Um, so that's a difference he and I have. On the Medicaid issue that you just talked about, um, so the O'Brien legislature cut uh, funding for our hospitals by taking some of this uh, so-called bed tax money and using it for other expenses. And when they did that, it kept the hospitals from getting federal matching money. Mm -hmm. So they essentially cut a total of $300 million of funding to our hospitals. Now my opponent says he wouldn't have done that, but he doesn't tell us how he's going to pay for the restoration of this. He just doesn't say how he's going to pay for the promises he's making. And one of the things I've said I'd do is with the Affordable Care Act now the law of the land, the federal government is offering New Hampshire about $1.1 billion to expand health insurance coverage for more and more people in the state. At the same time, the Affordable Care Act says the money that the state used to get for the uninsured from the federal government is going to go away because if we cover more people with insurance, we won't have that uninsured population. Mm -hmm. So that federal money is going away. The $1.1 billion is, is offered to the state and the next governor has to decide whether to accept that money or whether uh, not to. And my opponent says he won't accept that money, but he also wants to restore all this money to the hospitals. And again, he isn't telling us how he's going to pay for it. I think we should accept the money under terms that will help us design our own Medicaid program as well as we can for New Hampshire's needs, knowing our health care needs. Uh, but that's $1.1 billion into the New Hampshire economy. Um, it's a 100% payment by the federal government for new Medicaid covered uh, folks. And it means that people earning $15,000 a year or less, individuals, or families earning $30,000 or less, would have access to health insurance, which is so important for them and for, again, for our state. So th that's one of the major differences that we have to address. And it's one of the things that you know we're, I hope we can continue to work out with the hospitals uh, once we get through this election. Now, what if the Affordable Care Act is repealed? which of course a lot of people around the country are running uh, yeah. as part of their platform. What then? Well, look, elections matter. And if uh, we were to have a president and a Congress and a Senate that wanted to refe repeal the Affordable Care Act, what it would mean is that uh, children with pre-existing conditions could be denied insurance again. Uh, once again, individuals would have to pay for preventive and primary care so that they'd be delaying care more and more. Uh, fewer and fewer individuals would have health insurance. And again, insurance companies would be able to cap the amount of uh, medical 
medical bills they'll pay under your insurance plan no matter how much money mm -hmm. you've paid for them uh, to them over mm -hmm. your lifetime and they also uh, would be th this would mean that seniors would go back to paying for the prescription drugs in that donut hole you know that mm -hmm. was closed by mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act so there are a lot of things uh, young people who can now stay on their parents insurance up to age 26 wouldn't be able to do that anymore and it would continue to be um, a pre-existing condition that's the term uh, to be a woman uh, insurance companies would once again be able to charge women more for health insurance uh, than men simply because we have different medical needs uh, so that's what would be at stake and um, if that happens I will work as I did in the state Senate with Republicans and Democrats and independents in this state uh, to try to forge as comprehensive um, health care for our people, making sure that we attack health care costs, as I did in the state Senate, we have to lower our state's costs, but also making sure, uh, for instance, that young people could stay on their health insurance. But, you know, there's only that there are some health plans that the state doesn't, doesn't control. Mm -hmm. And so without uh, some sort of unifying plan across the country, um, there there are some things that a governor uh, can't do as much no, about. True. So that's true. one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand. Uh, a whole lot of companies have health insurance that only the federal government regulates. And so it's really important if we want access to care and we want to be able to make sure people are using preventive care and primary care and avoiding emergency rooms mm -hmm. and bringing costs down. Um, you know, That's something we're going to have to uh, focus on. One of the things I did work on with Governor Lynch in the state Senate was making sure that we were changing the way we reimbursed health care in New Hampshire. So we go from uh, reimbursing doctors or hospitals for every single procedure, mm -hmm. but instead reimbursing them for good outcomes. And that's a way uh, that I think we're going to be able to continue to see improvements and, lo and lowering of costs. Hmm. It's certainly, I think, a challenge. Sure. Uh, uh, there's no question about it. And it will be a long-running challenge. Yeah. It's not something yeah. that will be solved overnight. That's right. Incredible. That's right. Yeah. So huge. Now, I know that this is a subject that, that you've been active uh, with. Um, the subject of continuing state funding to Planned Parenthood yeah. has remained a hot-button issue in sure. New Hampshire and elsewhere. There are people who don't have a problem with the funding, but they think that it should go to other health organizations, maybe not so identified with abortion. And I genuinely don't know who's right or who's wrong on that. What do you think? Well, I support the funding of Planned Parenthood. Planned right. Parenthood provides critical health care for women and for men, uh, cancer screenings, mm -hmm. uh, birth control, um, and other basic health care services. Mm -hmm. um, a very small percent of what they do is abortion and no taxpayer money goes for abortion. Mm -hmm. no, um, no. And, no. and there are other medical uh, entities in the state who also provide these services and rely on federal funding and state funding uh, mm -hmm. to be able to provide again uh, birth control and basic cancer screenings. Planned Parenthood has though been an essential provider of basic primary care to men and women throughout the, throughout the state. Uh, for a long time. They have a great record and they provide care sometimes free of charge or on a sliding scale to the uninsured. And my opponent supports eliminating the funding for Planned Parenthood, uh, which I think is a real mistake because around the state, men and women care about whether their cancer screenings are covered, whether they can afford to have birth control. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to know that their basic health care is affordable so that they can make other economic decisions too. Uh, you don't want somebody choosing between um, having to pay for a cancer screening sure. or tuition for her children, for yeah. instance. And so these right. are really uh, major differences and I think that uh, women and men should understand that what's really at issue here is their ability to make their own health care decisions, um, also to afford basic health care. It shouldn't cost more for a woman to have basic health care than it costs for a mm -hmm. man, and to chart their own course um, economically. Mm. Well, again, that'll probably be back again 
a couple of more times at least huh, before it's finally settled yeah. somewhere or Well, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, that people will think about this issue in particular because we really need to make sure that, again, in an all-hands-on-deck state, mm -hmm. that everybody has the ability to afford their health care, mm -hmm. to participate in the economy, uh, to make their own decisions about mm -hmm. when they're going to have a family, mm -hmm. um, and to get the kind of health care they need when they need it at a cost that's fair and equal. Mm -hmm. Okay, now without question, the cost of education is right at the top of the budget yeah. driver list. Yeah. Yet in places like Manchester, classroom overcrowding has become one of the city's most urgent problems right now. What options would you have as governor to ensure that there's adequate funding for New Hampshire kids really to get the best possible education through the public school system? Sure. We want our kids to have a solid education. And it has to be a solid education that also is aligned with the 21st century economy. And that's what the innovation plan is all about. Mm -hmm. It's about not only what I, you know, restoring the funding to the university system and freezing tuition, but it's also about making sure we have a strong and flexible community college system and making sure we have science and math standards that are rigorous in our K through 12 system uh, and a hands-on kind of curriculum and engaging one so that more and more young people will be drawn into fields where science and technology and engineering and math are needed uh, in order to excel. And so that's some of what we need to focus on in terms of standards. One of the major differences between my opponent and me is that uh, while I was in the state senate, I worked with Governor Lynch and my colleagues. We developed um, a definition of an adequate education establishing kindergarten, public kindergarten for all of our kids in New Hampshire, uh, coming up with accountability standards for it and funding it. Um, we ended 15 years of lawsuits when we did that. My opponent says that the state really shouldn't have any role in education. He supports a constitutional amendment that would allow the state to walk away completely from its obligation. That drives property taxes up and it also leaves school systems uh, with, for instance, very overcrowded classrooms mm -hmm. like we've seen in Manchester because this uh, legislature, a legislature that my opponent supports and praises, cut funding to our local schools and I don't think that makes any sense. We've got some real challenges. We need to make sure uh, that we can target aid in ways that make sense uh, from a budgetary, budgetary and an education perspective, uh, but the constitutional amendment that my opponent supports uh, would allow the state to walk away from that obligation altogether and would really um, again, drive property taxes way up and see some really underfunded schools. Now this is a question that dogs every gubernatorial candidate, so you too. Um, and I know, I've know i heard your position, yeah. but so that the, the listeners will know what it is. Tell us how you feel about a New Hampshire sales tax or income tax, and I guess while you're at it about that question one that we'll all be voting on, the constitutional amendment mm -hmm. that would take uh, a state income tax off the table for forever. Sure. Th thanks for the question. I oppose an income or a sales tax and I would veto it if it came to my desk. Um, I also oppose uh, the constitutional amendment that's on the ballot that would ban an income tax uh, forever and ever in New Hampshire. And I oppose it because I don't think the Constitution is a place where we should make fiscal policy. I think we also don't want to bind future generations. They need to have the kind of education that we should be providing them to make their own fiscal decisions. And when they do, I'm confident they'll oppose an income or sales tax too, because I think it's wrong for New Hampshire. Maggie, believe it or not, time is flying. So we have actually a little over four minutes. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is now to focus in on whatever you want to focus in on and also let people know why they need to vote for you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, for having me. Uh, thanks to your viewers for watching this show. Uh, as you know, my husband Tom and I live in Exeter where we raised our two children, Ben and Meg. I'm a business lawyer, Tom's an educator. Um, I've spent my adult life bringing people together to find common sense solutions uh, to complicated problems. I've done that as a business lawyer, as a mom, and in the state senate. The choice in this election is incredibly stark. We can either build on the foundation we set with Governor Lynch, bringing people together, building our economy, moving forward, or we can choose a governor like my opponent who sides with this extreme legislature where the needs of middle class families take a backseat to a divisive and extreme agenda. My opponent, Ovid Lamontagne, 
sides with this legislature. They think it is wrong, for instance, for the state to ensure that every student in New Hampshire has access to public kindergarten. They would take the state out of the federal Medicare system and allow this legislature that's done uh, millions of dollars of cuts to our hospitals to run health care for our seniors. They've cut the university system budget by 50 percent and uh, they continue uh, to reject federal dollars for things like our public schools. In fact, my opponent, when he was chair of the Board of Education, his one accomplishment was to reject millions of federal dollars, no strings attached, for our public schools. They've also focused on other things that don't make sense. They focused on denying women access to cancer screenings, to birth control, and they focused on criminalizing abortion. These are not only the wrong priorities, they're expensive priorities because they drive our education costs up, tuition goes up, they drive our health care costs up, um, and they raise our property taxes. I have a record in the state senate of cutting spending and balancing budgets. I'm the only one in this race who's actually done that. We closed programs. We made sure that we were running things as effectively as possible. I've proposed budget reforms that will help us increase efficiency in state government. And I will continue to focus on balancing our budget while honoring our priorities, education and health care and public safety in particular. I'll do it without an income or a sales tax, which I will veto if it comes to my desk. I have an innovation plan that provides for tax credits, technical assistance for our businesses, and a strong and skilled workforce so that we can make sure that as innovative businesses come to our state, we have an education system that has prepared our citizens at all levels to work in this new economy with the kind of science, technology, engineering, math, and creative skills that we all need. That's what we can do if we remember that we are an all-hands-on-deck state where we come together, pitch in, find ways of solving our common problems. And when we do that, when we do that, and remember what binds us as Granite Staters, we will have an innovative, business-friendly state with a strong economy and opportunities for all of our families. So, Kathy, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I've really enjoyed being here. Well, I'm delighted we were able to get you back because I know that your schedule has been crazy, and um, yeah, I know your your campaign staff is going crazy trying to get you all the places right. that people are asking to see you and yeah. hear you. Well, thank you. And I'll just ask your viewers for, for their votes, too. Um, I just appreciate your support on Election Day. Thank you. That's the big thing to yeah. say today. Yeah. Well, I would also encourage people to go to your website, which is www dot innovate nh dot com and what's kind of fun about your website is that it's interactive that people can be on there commenting and asking questions and all kinds of good stuff that's right you must be getting a lot of hits we do i, I would we think do. yeah yeah well maggie it's hard to believe it's um only almost days away now that's right so very very best of luck to you you've run a great campaign and um, been out there for everybody to meet and hear and thanks for coming over to Bedford too M my pleasure thank you Kathy best of luck in the finals all right take care thank you well it is hard to believe we started this whole series back in May and slowly but surely made our way through the candidates through the preliminary election and here we are sitting on top of the final already and uh, Maggie ran an outstanding primary campaign, and, and she's continuing to do so for the final election. Um, and it's great that she was able to get over here because I know that just since May, her, her platform has evolved much, much larger than what we got a chance to talk about back in May. So I want to thank you all for watching. The big thing this year, it's an important year. Get out there and vote. Maggie told it like it is. You tell it like it is. We'll keep trying on our end, too. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.